What's in your pants, I right? Dude, it's, it's sewn into his underwear. Okay, while someone's underwear isn't necessarily a place you expect to find drugs, it's not a surprise that bust happened on I-75. Law enforcement has known for years that this highway is a cross-country drug trafficking pipeline. So from Michigan all the way down to Florida. And you've probably guessed the F word that's about to come up. The amount of fentanyl drastically within the past few years has increased. We found that I-75 runs through the three places in Florida with the most fentanyl deaths. And two of them are right here in the Tampa Bay area. It literally makes me sick to my stomach. Let's see what's brewing. I'm Jenna Bourne, and I'm an investigative reporter at 10 Tampa Bay. If you're new here, welcome to our caffeine-fueled deep dive into issues that matter to you. Why are we meeting at a skate park? Uh, we're meeting at a skate park because that's the one thing I think Nick loved to do almost more than anything. He loved to be outdoors. He'd much rather be outdoors than inside. <laughs> The best cat in the world, Charlie. Ow! There still is a stigma out there, um, especially with drug addicts. Um, some people assume that they're from broken homes, bad families, bad upbringing. There's a lot of addiction out there that they come from good homes. We live in a good neighborhood and that doesn't matter. I believe Nick um, had some mental health issues and he, for me, he was trying to self-medicate. In 2019, Kathy Fouché found her son, Nick Malamatis, dead in her home. He was holding a needle. When I got the uh, coroner's report, the autopsy report, it said accidental overdose due to fentanyl. It's hard as a parent because you never think you're gonna outlive your kids. So this is where fentanyl winds up, but how does it get here? Over the past year, our 10 Investigates team has been looking into different ways fentanyl gets into our country and our communities. 10 Investigates' Jennifer Titus went to the U.S.-Mexico border last year and met with Customs and Border Protection officers to see these machines. They're kind of like what your bag goes through at the airport, but for trucks. We need something that can penetrate the steel so we can look inside refrigerated uh, frozen commodities is another one. So this high energy, we can actually see what's inside. And we told you in March, the White House's Office of National Drug Control Policy identified the U.S. mail in 2019 as the most common distribution medium for fentanyl entering the U.S. and moving domestically to its end users. The chemicals are derived from China, shipped into Mexico, where the laboratories are then producing what we see as straight fentanyl powder and or a lot of what we're starting to see are pressed pills. We see them come from areas along the border because it's easily brought into the United States from across the U.S. border and then shipped throughout the United States. It's also trafficked through literal traffic on I-75. I-75, it's a main conduit through six states, so from Michigan all the way down to Florida. From Detroit, through Cincinnati, Knoxville, Atlanta, Tampa, and ending in Fort Lauderdale, it's long been known to law enforcement as a pipeline for drug trafficking. Officers used to find a lot of heroin. Now fentanyl flows through it. It's kind of like all we have right now is a Band-Aid, and we need like a tourniquet to, to put on this problem. We need to like cut it off. We need to stop the flow. I asked some friends who report in areas along I-75 to tell you what it's like. I'm Grace King with WBIR in Knoxville, where authorities say the drug problem is getting worse. They credit part of that to East Tennessee's central location, about halfway on I-75 with a direct route to Detroit. We knew here uh, in Knoxville, law enforcement knew that a large portion of our drugs were coming from that Detroit area. For the past eight months, law enforcement there have been targeting people from Detroit, who they say are using I-75 to traffic drugs into the Knoxville area. They're calling it the 313 initiative. That's the area code for Detroit. 
Few people know it or even believe it, but Mexican cartels are active here in Northern Ohio and Southern Michigan. Drug seizures on I-75 in Ohio, nowhere has more than Wood County. Although some state agencies like Ohio State Highway Patrol track their fentanyl busts along I-75, Florida Highway Patrol does not. FHP doesn't even track how much fentanyl they bust across the state. Their drug data lumps fentanyl into the category called other. So it's hard to say exactly how much fentanyl Florida troopers are finding along I-75 or anywhere else. But what we do know is that more people are dying in Florida from fentanyl than any other drug. In the first six months of 2022, two of the top three areas in Florida with the most fentanyl deaths were right here in Tampa Bay. Medical Examiner District 6, that covers Pinellas and Pasco counties. Second is District 17, that's Broward County. And number three brings it back to the Bay Area, District 13, which is Hillsborough County. I-75 connects them all. We went to the number one area with the most fentanyl deaths to find out what they're doing about it. Get. Get. At the Pasco Sheriff's Office, Good. Narcotics Canine Flash and his handler, Deputy yeah. Anthony Casparitas, are part of the highway interdiction team, yeah. known as HIT. Down. Get. So HIT's primary goal with the sheriff's office is to disrupt the flow of illegal narcotics. What makes I-75 in particular so appealing to drug traffickers? Uh, just the drop-off points you get, I mean, where it takes you through our state. He says HIT finds fentanyl so often, they've stopped letting their canines go into a car after they've sniffed and alerted. They're worried the dogs will overdose. I don't want to run the, the risk of my dog putting his nose on it. He's my buddy, he's my buddy 24-7. Spend more time with him than I spend uh, my family. We encounter fentanyl on a daily basis. Every single day we, we run into it. Hit Deputy James Dunn told us he arrested people on fentanyl charges right before this interview. It affects everyone's lives. Most of the crime we have within Pasco County is because of drugs. You have these people that use the drugs and they have to have a way to fund, fund their drug habit so they go out and commit other crimes. So it affects every single neighborhood. Yeah. These drugs don't stay on the highway. They wind up in our communities. It's everywhere. It is everywhere. And in our loved ones' hands. Unfortunately, Nick was incarcerated quite a bit in jail. So whenever a special occasion came up, he would have somebody that was an artist in the jail with him draw something special. So this was part of his um, happy birthday mom. He'd send me those and he had a handwritten note with it. A lot of people are dying just like Nick died because their drug of choice was laced with fentanyl and they didn't know it. He still was my son. So thank you for letting me share. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, we have resources for you in the video description below. Thanks for watching What's Brewing. Subscribe to 10 Tampa Bay's YouTube channel and add the What's Brewing playlist to your library so you don't miss an episode. And I'll see you next time. Came here for one overdose, made up with seven. What the hell going on? Great question. Tampa police claim field testing solved that mystery. These guys snorted fentanyl mixed with a horse tranquilizer called xylazine. Oh, that's my son. That's my brother. Can I identify him? Okay. All seven survived. The number of overdose deaths involving xylazine is skyrocketing, but we found emergency rooms don't test for it. And that gap leaves people who don't know they're taking it in the dark. They need to know this. Let's see what's brewing. I think my friends none of them got a hold to some fentanyl. Um, you hurry up here, please. I can't wake them up. Hey, hey, can you hear me? There more than one? Yo, there's two people. Hey, I got another one over there on the ground. I got Darkie. Okay. Uh, I got another one. I take it. We got four people down over there, and there's one down over there. Hey! Come on! Come on! Come on! 
I need oxygen. Corporal, it's five total. Where's my brother, man? I, I don't know. Okay. There's, There's six people. Jones. There's six people out. We came here for one overdose, we ended up with seven. What the hell going on? They all feel like flies. I've never seen anything like it, right? They were just falling out the trunk. What'd y'all tag, man? It smelled funny and it tasted funny. Who's got the cocaine? Where is it now? We got the bag right here. Yeah, I know. Yeah, I know this dude. Name Myrtle. I don't see the roof. Seven people overdosed tonight. Seven. I'm looking you dead in the eyes, because mm -hmm. I'm being honest, all right, off of what you gave them. I ain't, I ain't, you can't tell me I gave anybody those rules tonight. But don't worry. As usual, I've got plenty to say. We first reported on xylazine in November 2022. It's some kind of horse tranquilizer. You might be thinking, why would anyone take that? People who take xylazine on purpose have told researchers that xylazine gives fentanyl legs, meaning it makes the euphoria that they feel when they take fentanyl last longer. But a lot of people don't know they're taking xylazine. And if they don't overdose, they might just think they got the good stuff. Xylazine also makes the go-to overdose reversal medication for opioids less effective at saving lives. We're talking about naloxone, better known by the brand name Narcan. So if someone is overdosing due to fentanyl and xylazine, the Narcan will only mitigate the effects of the fentanyl and not the xylazine. And so what does that look like in practice? In practice, it makes the, the treatment and the saving of lives more difficult. Body cam video shows first responders giving this guy at least three rounds of Narcan. And listen to what paramedics told this guy after he woke up. We're going to the hospital, I assume. Because we gave you like six Narcan. The Sunshine State's xylazine problem is getting worse. 2022 was the first year that Florida medical examiners were required to report when people tested positive for xylazine after death. We've now learned that in the first six months of 2022, medical examiners reported 218 people died after taking xylazine. Compare those six months to all of 2021 before reporting xylazine was required, when Florida medical examiners voluntarily identified 236 deaths. And a new CDC data analysis released in June 2023 found the number of overdose deaths involving xylazine in the U.S. was 34 times higher in 2021 than it was in 2018. We're talking an increase from 102 deaths to 3,468. And those are just the ones we know about. But despite the fact that xylazine is spreading, we found out that emergency rooms don't test for it. Why don't ERs test for xylazine? Well, xylazine is not routinely tested in labs. It requires specialized analytic techniques that right now are more expensive and harder to get. This is Dr. Charlie Sand. He's the medical director at Hillsborough Community College's EMS training program and chair of Hillsborough County's Emergency Medical Planning Council. So yeah, he knows his stuff. Xylazine is a what we call a quick metabolizer. Its half-life is 25 to 50 minutes. So even if we had the testing available, after an hour, it's might not detect it. So who does test for xylazine? Crime labs testing evidence and toxicologists testing dead people. It strikes me that that leaves out people who are actively taking it. You know, people who are still alive. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there are several good things that come out of it. We can counsel people that this is being mixed in your drugs. There is an increase in overdose fatalities. 
so they need to know this. Without testing, the only way someone might find out their drugs are getting mixed with xylazine is if they develop these horrible skin wounds where the tissue dies. We're blurring these images because they're so bad, but if you need to be able to identify what these wounds look like, we've got a link for you in the video description below. They just eat away at the flesh, they go down the bone, they're huge lesions of just open wounds. If we can't treat them with skin grafts and antibiotics, Sometimes we need to do amputations. Obviously, it's, it's graphic and kind of gross to talk about this stuff, but why is it important? Well, it's important because we want people to know what they're taking and to avoid it. It just wasn't healing. Amy Hicks is the Regional Outreach Director for the Recovery Epicenter Foundation. I'm seeing a lot of um, open wounds that won't heal especially in the homeless community. She tells us she gives those people first aid supplies, encourages them to get professional medical care, and talks to them about xylazine. It's important to me because um, in my life, I have needed help to um, get sober and to maintain my sobriety. And um, there were certain people that um, I think without them, I wouldn't have made it. And so I want to you know, give back they need more help than I can give them, you know, so that can be hard. Today, she's doing what she can. So we're making, we call them recovery starter kits to give out to the homeless. She and her colleagues are getting extra help from people in recovery who are staying in the foundation's short-term transitional housing in Clearwater. They told us they were cool with being on camera. Basic hygiene items, and then raincoats, washcloths, cooling towels, nail clippers, and then we include Narcan. Narcan because when every second counts, the homeless can help each other until first responders get there. Deactivating, no further action from me. Deactivating. Turn body camera off. Deactivating camera. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, we have resources for you in the video description below. Thanks for watching What's Brewing. Subscribe to 10 Tampa Bay's YouTube channel and add the What's Brewing playlist to your library so you don't miss an episode. And I'll see you next time. My brother and I saw that last email that he had opened and it said, your package has been delivered. Shelby Cooper's brother, Ryan, overdosed on pills. She says he bought with crypto on the dark web. You're playing with fire. Ryan's mom says the fentanyl was delivered right to their mailbox. Why is the US mail so much more attractive to drug traffickers than other shipping entities. We've learned the amount of synthetic opioids seized from the US mail has increased tenfold in the past five years. So what's being done to stop it? We're in a state of crisis and um, something needs to change. Let's see what's brewing. Hi, I'm Jenna Bourne and I'm an investigative reporter at 10 Tampa Bay. If you're new here, Welcome to our caffeine-fueled deep dive into issues that matter to you. Why did you want to meet out here? What's so special about this place? Well, for years and years, Ryan played soccer um, at these fields. I'm talking from the time he was probably six. <laughs> uh, so these have a lot of special memories for us. One game, he had scored three goals. Yeah. He was so proud of himself like after real that jazz game. Stuff. Yeah. yeah. These are the memories that you want to think about yeah. when you mm -hmm. think of him. Yeah. Exactly. And him healthy and active and happy and, happy and mm -hmm. doing things he loved, like sports. What has life been like without him? Um, pretty much like the worst pain imaginable. Mm -hmm. I found him. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yes. Um, when I came home from work that day, his dog was downstairs and I see that he had gone to the bathroom on the floor and I'm like, Ryan, why did you let Levi out? And so I was hollering, Ryan, I'm home and no answer, no answer. And then like, I didn't want to walk upstairs because I, I knew something wasn't right. And I went up, and when I went around the corner, there he was, um, 
on the floor right outside of our bathroom. How did Ryan get the drugs that mm -hmm. killed him? He ordered them through uh, the dark web. They would come through the U.S. Postal Service right to our house. And what did he think he was getting? So he ordered something similar to Xanax and it was laced with fentanyl without him knowing, obviously. Um, and we were able to get into his computer. My brother and I saw that last email that he had opened and it said, your package has been delivered. Ryan Cooper was one of 5,791 Floridians who died from a fentanyl overdose in 2021 the deadliest year yet. We're still waiting on 2022 overdose numbers. And as overdoses skyrocket, we want to know how opioids like fentanyl are getting into the U.S. My colleague Jennifer Titus went to the U.S.-Mexico border a few months ago and met with U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers to see what they call multi-energy portal machines. That might sound like some sci-fi gadget from Doctor Who, but no, they're very real and they're kind of like what your bag goes through at the airport, but for trucks. We need something that can penetrate the steel so we can look inside. Refrigerated uh, frozen commodities is another one. So this high energy, we can actually see what's inside. But in 2019, the White House's Office of National Drug Control Policy identified the U.S. mail as the most common distribution medium for fentanyl entering the U.S. and moving domestically to its end users. <laughs> The chemicals are derived from China, shipped into Mexico, where the laboratories are then producing what we see as straight fentanyl powder and or a lot of what we're starting to see are pressed pills. We see them come from areas along the border because it's easily brought into the United States from across the U.S. border and then shipped throughout the United States. It's literally needles in, in the haystack that we're looking for. We asked U.S. Postal Inspector Damian Crable to weigh in. He's based in Tampa and investigates crimes involving the mail. Why is the U.S. mail so much more attractive to drug traffickers than other shipping entities? We're seeing a trend away from the U.S. mail being a, a source for, for foreign influx. Um, that's not to say that it isn't present in domestic mail. One obvious reason why the U.S. mail might be more satisfying or more help, helpful for drug traffickers is if I want to open a package, I need, and, and you're a drug dealer who has put this in the mail, and you don't want me to open that package, I need to go to a federal judge and convince them to issue a search warrant. U.S. Postal Inspection Service data shows synthetic opioids like fentanyl seized from the U.S. mail increased tenfold in the past five years. While it's possible that an increase in that could be due to something like an increase in volume of those things in the mail, much of it is also going to be attributed to us getting better at finding them and intercepting them. And um, I can certainly tell you in my time with the agency, we have gotten better at it. We're talking an increase from 211 pounds in fiscal year 2017 to 2,124 pounds in fiscal year 2022. That's about the same weight as a walrus or a polar bear or the Liberty Bell. And since the DEA says just two milligrams of fentanyl could kill someone, 2,124 pounds of fentanyl is enough to kill more than 481 million people. That's more than the entire U.S. population, which is wild. What procedures are in place right now for inspecting the uh, mail that's coming in? How thoroughly are these packages being inspected? One of the things this family wanted to know is how are illicit drugs detected in the U.S. mail? What's being done to stop this? Uh, it's a horrible tragedy, of course, and I'm very uh, sad to hear because I'm a federal law enforcement agent working for a federal law enforcement agency. We don't want to share too much about the ways that we go about conducting our investigations because it would obviously have a negative impact on future investigations. But uh, she and everybody can rest assured that we have many tools in our arsenal, um, some that I can generally talk about. We have a pretty robust and ever more robust uh, intelligence and analytics arm that looks at historical trends, current trends, uh, data from many sources, including partner agencies and, and work that they do uh, that helps us target packages. And we combine that with information that we may be aware of locally to take a closer look in, at certain things. 
This U.S. Postal Service strategy document says the Postal Inspection Service created a nationwide task force officer program during fiscal year 2020. Those task force officers are typically state and local police officers embedded with postal inspectors, providing access to local police intelligence. And that strategy document says postal inspectors now use these handheld narcotic analyzers, which allow inspectors to scan for more than 450 controlled substances without touching them. Data we crunched from the USPS Office of the Inspector General shows it opened 1,224 narcotics investigations between 2017 and 2022. According to the US Department of Justice, that included an investigation that led to two Tampa Bay area men serving prison time. The DOJ says they mostly used the US mail to ship counterfeit oxycodone pills from Clearwater and Seminole to Boston. The department says the traffickers ordered the fentanyl and pill presses from China. What we do see is a pretty large market for fentanyl precursors. And fentanyl precursors are, of course, the raw materials that go in to these products that are usually shipped to a manufacturer in, for example, Mexico or Canada, et cetera, and then is transshipped into the United States. UC San Diego professor Dr. Timothy Mackey and his company S3 Research used funding from the National Institute on Drug Abuse to create technology that scans different parts of the internet for illicit drug sales. Mackey says traffickers use tactics to evade detection, like printing labels on their own instead of at a retail location, or using fake return addresses. He tells us the U.S. Postal Service is what his team sees the most frequently in posts about packaging and shipping. We not only see what they're shipping uh, with, they also often uh, provide evidence that they ship something. So, okay. and that's that's because, you know, a lot of uh, buyers are, are concerned about scammers, are concerned about people ripping them off. The importance level of inspecting the mail coming in, you can't really put a price on it or a level on it because if you were to ask someone how important is it, that your loved one is alive right now. That is how important it is mm -hmm. that we are checking these packages. What would you say to other Ryans out there mm -hmm. right now who are ordering mm -hmm. drugs online? I would say you're playing with fire. You just don't know what's in there, so it's not worth the risk. If you or a loved one is struggling with addiction, we have resources for you in the video notes below. Thanks for watching What's Brewing. Subscribe to 10 Tampa Bay's channel and add the What's Brewing playlist to your library so you don't miss an episode. And I'll see you next time.